This is News 5 at 11. Now at 11, Americans processing shocking news that the president and first lady tested positive for COVID-19. Tonight we lay out today's rapid changes from the president's diagnosis to his hospitalization all in less than 24 hours. I'm going to Walter Reed Hospital. I think I'm doing very well. And we're digging deeper into the experimental treatment that may help him fight off the virus. But first, Willowick's police chief says one of his officers might not be alive tonight if it weren't for his bulletproof vest. He says a man who led police on a high-speed chase opened fire on officers when they caught up to him. As News 5's Tanisha Cordell found out, police say they returned that fire and now that man is in a hospital tonight. This all started in East Lake. Investigators say police there got a call about a suspect driving erratically, possibly intoxicated. But by the time they located that suspect, he had already crossed over into Willowick, sparking that chase ending right here on Daniel Drive. We spoke to Willowick Police Chief Brian Turner. He says before that suspect stopped and fired shots here, the suspect ran from police crashing into another car at an intersection less than a mile away. No injuries there, but Chief says the suspect kept going, eventually turned onto Daniel Drive and started shooting at two Willowick officers. Those officers fired back. One of them was hit. Thank God, and the, the body armor stopped around. I was able to speak with him as I got on scene before he went to the hospital. He's okay. Shooken up, uh, obviously, but both of my guys are going to go home, so that's, that's really all I care about. Turner says the Bureau of Criminal Investigation is taking part in this investigation. BCI is going to process the crime scene and, and, and do everything down there. They're going to take their time to make sure they don't miss anything. That suspect was flown to a nearby hospital for treatment. Police still gathering more information on that suspect. I'm told Willowick detectives will conduct an internal investigation. Tanisha Cordell, News 5. Okay, now we take a live look outside Walter Reed Medical Center. The president was taken there tonight as a precaution, we're told, as he fights COVID-19. A group of supporters gathering there, you can see right now, to support him. And the president tweeted just moments ago, going well, I think, and thanking everyone for their support. More who are close to the president have now tested positive, too. And that includes advisor Kellyanne Conway and North Carolina Senator Tom Tillis, who attended the president's Supreme Court nomination announcement on Saturday. Now, sources tell ABC News the president's symptoms include a low-grade fever, nasal, nasal congestion, and a cough. Now, it's not clear how he contracted the virus, but the news came hours after one of his closest advisors, we're talking about Hope Hicks, announced that she tested positive. Hicks traveled with the president to a rally on Wednesday and to the debate here in Cleveland just a day prior on Tuesday. Ohio Lieutenant Governor John Husted also attended Tuesday's debate. Tonight, the governor's office confirmed a test today came back negative for Houston. Governor Mike DeWine and First Lady Fran DeWine also tested negative. The governor says they were on board Air Force One 11 days ago when the president visited the Dayton area for a rally. Now, this is a story that has been seemingly developing hour by hour. It started Thursday night when President Trump tweeted he was waiting on test results following that news about Hope Hicks. At 9.45 Thursday night, the president confirms advisor Hope Hicks tested positive in an interview with Fox News and says he's been tested as well. At 10.44 Thursday night, the president tweets that he and the First Lady are waiting on their test results. Just over two hours later, the president confirms on Twitter he and the First Lady have both tested positive for the virus. By Friday morning, the president's daughter and her husband had tested negative. Late Friday morning, Melania Trump tweets that she has mild symptoms. The White House chief of staff tells reporters the president has mild symptoms and is in good spirits. At 2 p.m. Friday, the president's campaign manager announces any event involving the president or his family will be postponed or become virtual events. After 3 o'clock, the city of Cleveland says it is aware of 11 cases of the virus from planning or setup for Tuesday's presidential debate. The president has been treated with an antibody cocktail, according to a statement from his physician Friday just after 4 p.m. By 525, the White House confirms President Trump will soon be taken to Walter Reed Medical Center for, quote, the next few days. Just before 6 o'clock, Eric Trump tweets about his father's strength and conviction. 
By 6 o'clock, Democratic presidential nominee Joe Biden tweeted, this cannot be a partisan moment. At 6.20, the president exits the White House and boards the helicopter bound for the hospital. Shortly after that, the president's Twitter account posted a video message from President Trump thanking the American people for their support. I want to thank everybody for the tremendous support. I'm going to Walter Reed Hospital. I think I'm doing very well. But we're going to make sure that things work out. The First Lady is doing very well. So uh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. I will never forget it. Thank you. Now, we wanted to learn more about the experimental medication the president took before heading to the hospital. So we reached out to some local doctors who are very familiar with this drug created to fight COVID-19. We also heard from the company's CEO. Before the president left the White House in Marine One, his physician, Dr. Sean Conley, sent out this memo indicating that President Trump received a single 8-gram dose of a polyclonal antibody cocktail made by New York-based pharmaceutical company Regeneron. If we give our antibodies, we hope that we will give his immune system enough of a boost so that he can win this and make a complete recovery. Dr. Claudia Hoyen, an infectious disease specialist with Rainbow Children's Hospital, says the experimental drug's clinical trial looks promising. They saw a great decrease in the viral load. Uh, they thought they saw kind of trends or correlations towards people needing less hospitalization. Um, and also exhibiting fewer symptoms. The handmade antibody cocktail mimics the antibodies of those who have already fought off COVID-19. If you've had the virus, you make antibodies. And if you, if you take the, the serum from somebody who's had the virus and give it to somebody who just, just now got it, their antibodies can help. Regeneron CEO says the White House had to get FDA approval to give the president the drug. It's called a compassionate use basis, which is really just an individual experimental approach. Local doctors speculate the president's trip to Walter Reed comes out of an abundance of caution. He's the president, and they are wanting to be sure that uh, he has all of the attention that he needs. Um, that if for some reason he were to become more ill, he would already be in the hospital. So the White House shared late tonight that the president is not requiring oxygen, but he did start remdesivir therapy, which is another experimental drug. Officials say he completed his first dose and is resting comfortably. Meanwhile, the CEO of Regeneron says only a single dose of medication was needed to get the president through until he recovers from COVID-19. Okay, the president's battle with COVID-19 has some calling for stepped-up enforcement of Ohio's mask mandate at future Trump rallies here in the Buckeye State. Now, it comes after city and state leaders say many members of the president's close circle seemingly ignored a mask requirement during Tuesday's debate. Our Five on Your Side investigator Joe Pakanakis has more on their concerns. Well, local, state, and city leaders say they understand First Amendment rights when it comes to political rallies, but believe political events that aren't observing social distancing and Ohio's mask mandate set up a potential health and safety issue. And I'm thrilled to be back in Ohio with thousands. Thousands have attended Trump political rallies in Ohio during the pandemic. Some in attendance at this Toledo rally last week were seen wearing masks. Hand sanitizer and masks provided at the event. But a significant number of people in the crowd could be seen grouping together, not wearing masks. And we asked some if they were concerned about the spread of the virus. No, very comfortable, very happy to be here. The majority of the Trump supporters not wearing masks. Ohio House Minority Leader Amelia Strong Sykes from Akron attended Tuesday's debate in Cleveland. She says the lack of masks by some during the debate and the president's illness indicate the need to explore ways to enforce Ohio's mask mandate more directly at political rallies in the future. And so I would hope that uh, not only the governor, but people from uh, the Republican Party are willing to step up and stand up to the president and say, these events are dangerous. But Friday, Ohio Governor Mike DeWine said he hadn't heard about any spikes in COVID-19 cases due to Ohio Trump rallies. I've not been told uh, 
that anybody out in the counties, as far as the local health departments, have picked anything up. Cleveland Councilman Blaine Griffin told News 5 he's hoping the president and the first lady make quick recoveries from the virus, but was concerned the city mask mandate and debate rules requiring masks for spectators were seemingly ignored by some during the presidential debate. And it's the reason why we passed the mask ordinance. Griffin says he watched as Cleveland Clinic doctors tried to give Trump supporters masks at the debate, but some refused. It's unfortunate that the president of the United States was the one who chose to, uh, him and his entourage chose to break the rules. And we reached out to Cuyahoga County's Republican Party chairman to get his take on mask enforcement at future Trump rallies. We were then referred to the press secretary for the Trump campaign right here in Ohio. We're still waiting for a response. I'm five on your side investigator Joe Paganakis. And as we stated, the city of Cleveland says there are 11 positive cases stemming from the media or people involved in pre-debate planning and setup. The city's stressing none of these people ever entered the debate hall. No one received credentials until they returned a negative COVID test. And according to the city, most of the positive cases were from out of state. And the number of cases does not include President Trump, the First Lady, or Hope Hicks. The city says those three individuals were tested a part of a different process and not at Cleveland Clinic. The news of the president's hospitalization comes at a crucial time in the 2020 presidential election following that debate and just ahead of the start of early voting in Ohio. The Trump campaign will have to make adjustments that, at the very least, take him off the campaign trail for up to two weeks. News 5 political analyst Tom Sutton says this will be a blow to his usual campaign style. It has a huge impact on Trump's ability to campaign. He prefers to campaign in person, as we know. Uh, he will, at best, be able to tweet out. What impact will that have on his voters? What impact will that have on this campaign going into Election Day? Sutton believes at least one of the two remaining debates will be canceled because of the president's illness. The next one is scheduled for October 15th in Miami. In the meantime, former Vice President Joe Biden is pulling all negative ads in light of the president's diagnosis. A source tells ABC News it may still be a few days before all of those ads actually stop running since many were already in circulation. Biden says he and his wife both received negative COVID-19 test results today. Okay, from the moment the president said he was waiting on those test results, News 5 has been on top of this story. And you can see all of our coverage. Stay up to date with any more developments by downloading the News 5 app or by searching for News 5 on any streaming device. And now the race is on to find out who may have been exposed after the president tests positive for coronavirus. Our coverage continues with an in-depth look at what goes into contact tracing. Oh, it's a chilly night, a frosty night for many, but I see 70s in your future again coming up. We start tonight with a weekend filled with gun violence in Cleveland. We counted at least 12 shootings from Friday night to early Monday morning. There were 14 different victims, according to Cleveland police. Victims include the grandson of Cleveland Mayor Frank Jackson and at least four children, including a 12-year-old shot outside a recreation center. The continued gun violence is now reaching young people in places they should feel safe. Our Five on Your Side investigator Joe Paganakis turned to city leaders to find out what can be done to improve safety at nearly two dozen rec centers citywide. Well, council members here at Cleveland City Hall know there needs to be a comprehensive plan to try and slow down city gun violence. And those city leaders and parents believe the way to start is with a greater police presence. Having to scrape the blood up of a child, a team member, one of my kids, is a problem for me. Kendra Harris is a Cleveland mother who had to witness the aftermath of the shooting of a 12-year-old and two others just outside the Portland Outhwaite Rec Center yesterday, just after 8 p.m. This was a Sunday, regular kids out here just playing, doing what they was gonna do. Harris says the 12-year-old left in critical condition as a teammate with her children on the Renegades Cleveland Muni football team, which plays here at Dwayne Browder Field, next to another of the city's rec centers, the Lonnie Burton Rec Center. But who was the law for us to protect us while we're doing something positive because we are here having a game. Harris and other Cleveland Muni football parents spoke with Cleveland Councilman and Public Safety Committee Chairman Blaine Griffin during a Zoom discussion arranged by News 5. And I just want to know that because I have, I also have kids out here that's playing and have been playing. Cleveland parents demanding greater police visibility at city rec centers. This community has a right 
to make sure that they can play and enjoy themselves and be safe. Because of the September 19th shooting, Griffin pledged to meet with the Cleveland Safety Director, Cleveland Police Headquarters, and leaders with CMHA Police this week to work out a coordinated plan for rec center safety. This is a time for action. This is a time for us to try to be able to bring the full weight of city services around these centers and for this community. Meanwhile, Cleveland Muni football families are giving their support to all three shooting victims. Especially prayers for the family because he's fighting and he's strong. He's 12 years old and just as need to be served. And Cleveland police are reviewing surveillance video taken near those rec centers. If you have any information about who may be responsible for these shootings, you're asked to contact Cleveland police headquarters. Reporting in downtown Cleveland, I'm filing your side investigator Joe Paganakis. Okay, we reached out to Cleveland police to learn about patrols at rec centers and to see if they have any comment. We'll let you know if we hear back. I want to acknowledge Frank, Mayor Frank Jackson on the, um, the passing of his grandson. Okay, so please hold the number for Frank Q. Jackson. So noted. Cleveland city leaders offered their condolences tonight to Mayor Frank Jackson after the shooting death of his grandson, Frank Q. Jackson. Police say somebody shot and killed the 24-year-old just steps from a playground in the Garden Valley housing complex shortly after 9 Sunday night. Cleveland police are searching for his killer. Crime Stoppers now offering a reward. Now, some of the violence in Cleveland is not as recent, but friends and family of a man killed in the city more than two years ago say that pain is still fresh. Who are we here for? Andre! So today should have been Andre Brown's 36th birthday. Police say he and a friend were gunned down in a car on Stevenson Avenue in Cleveland in February of 2019. His case is still unsolved. Andre's girlfriend says his loved ones came together tonight to remember his life and take a stand against the gun violence in Cleveland. I wish whoever did this to him and his friend would just turn themselves in. I mean, you're hurting. He has a mother, family, who just really want to know, like, why did you have to do this to him? Just put the guns down, please. Put the guns down. Andre's friends tell us he was a fun-loving family man who was the last person you'd expect to be shot and killed. They think he was in the wrong place at the wrong time on that day. Violence a problem in Akron, too, where police are investigating the shooting death of an 18-year-old at a party near the University of Akron campus. Police say there was a fight at that party around 1.30 in the morning. Somebody opened fire. Maya McFetrich was killed. A 22-year-old was also hurt. Maya just graduated from Berea Mid Park High School earlier this year. Police believe somebody at the party either saw something or even recorded something on a phone that could help them find Maya's killer. Please consider contacting the police department and share anything that you may know, because any detail uh, may matter. It could be the difference to shift this investigation that allow our detectives an opportunity to bring the person responsible into justice. University of Akron leaders, Akron Mayor Dan Horgan and police say they are all working together now to find ways to make the neighborhoods around the university, especially south, ex uh, south of Exchange Street, a safer place to live and work. With violence this weekend in many major cities in the area, we want to know if you're part of a group working to stop the shootings. If you think your group is doing something unique, we want to hear from you. Email us at wews5tips at scripts.com or you can call 216-431-3700. In other news, a new visitor's policy takes effect at university hospitals tomorrow. The change is in response to growing COVID-19 numbers here in Ohio. The hospital was allowing patients to have one visitor at a time, but as of Tuesday, patients will have to pick one designated visitor per day. UH says limiting visitors will limit the potential exposure and spread of the virus. The hospital's changes come less than a week after the Cleveland Clinic updated its visitation policies because of COVID-19. You can find the changes for both hospitals on our website, news5cleveland.com. And as hospitals fight the surge, they continue urging vaccination. Today, we learned Pfizer plans to ask the FDA for emergency use authorization for kids 5 to 11 years of age. And that got us wondering, how are the efforts going for eligible children in Ohio? Well, we reached out to the Ohio Department of Health. 
and learned almost 41 percent of Ohioans ages 12 to 17 have started the vaccination process. About 35 percent are fully vaccinated. That's compared to about 46 percent fully vaccinated nationwide. Now to adults and the COVID vaccine. New, new numbers out today show Ohio companies are less likely to require proof of vaccination or a negative COVID test compared to other companies nationwide. The Small Business Pulse survey from the U.S. Census was taken earlier this month. It found nationally about 10 percent of small businesses required vaccination for employees. In Ohio, that number was 3.5 percent. As for requiring negative COVID tests, 6.9% of Ohio businesses say they required one before workers reported to their jobs. That's compared with 9.7% nationwide. Cleveland city leaders are starting to make decisions about how to spend millions of dollars in relief money from the federal government. City council leaders approved a plan to set aside $20 million from the American Rescue Plan to develop a citywide broadband network. The digital divide in Cleveland is one of the worst in the country. It's estimated one in three people in the city do not have access to the internet. The pandemic only emphasized that problem. Cleveland Metro Schools scrambled to get students connected when it moved to online learning early in this pandemic. City Council's committing $20 million to this project, says it will need additional funding to set up the network. Council also agreed to send $5 million to the Greater Cleveland Food Bank. Money will help fund improvements at the Food Bank's new center on Coit Road and at its existing facility on South Waterloo. Food Bank's work has been critical during this pandemic. According to its website, it helped more than 38,500 new families in 2020. It distributed 6.8 million pounds of food last year. A new Ohio bill would require doctors to disclose contested side effects to patients seeking an abortion. If the measure becomes law, doctors would have to tell women the procedure could lead to depression, suicidal thoughts, feelings of guilt or PTSD, and may even increase their risk of breast cancer, despite scientific research not finding a cause and effect relationship between abortion and breast cancer. The bill would also require patients to undergo a fetal ultrasound. Sponsors claim it would ensure women understand the risk, but Planned Parenthood argues that the bill contains harmful misinformation. In Texas, a San Antonio doctor who said he performed an abortion in defiance of a new state law is being sued by two, two people. Former attorneys in Arkansas and Illinois filed lawsuits today against Dr. Alan Braid. Dr. Braid said in a Washington Post column, this weekend that he violated the law that took effect September 1st. That's when the state put a near total ban on that procedure. The restriction can only be enforced through private lawsuits. The attorneys say that they sued to force a court review of the law. Still ahead on News 5 at 11, a Parma woman is stepping up to help her neighbors when the need is bigger than ever. We'll show you just how much her grassroots fundraiser has grown. Plus, the demand for air travel is only expected to grow in the coming years, but aviation experts say the pool of eligible pilots is shrinking. Why the profession is seeking or seeing a shortage right now. Get ready. We've got some heavy flooding rainfall moving your way, plus fall knocking on the door. Coming up. began with the promise and opportunity that comes with the new year. And then three confirmed cases. Stocks took a free fall. All three fears of the coronavirus in Cuyahoga County. Everything changed. All non-essential businesses are closed. It's bad. Lost my job last month. <laughs> Unrest in Minneapolis over the death of George Floyd, now spilling into Cleveland. But amid the fear, the frustration, and the loss, we found strength, hope, and a way to keep going. I think they're amazing. I think they're amazing. And in many ways, we made this year of change. We can all survive this thing. A year of growth, too. Together, we can be a better world.